The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Australian Retirement Trust, ABN 60905 115 063, AFSL number 228975 and is limited to publicly available information. General advice may be provided by our sponsor, but does not take into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's trusted by over 4,000 advisors and more than 2 million members. With over $200 billion in retirement savings, they have the size and scale to seek out world-class investment opportunities that others may miss and are committed to working with advisors to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include super savings and Q Super FUM and members at June 2022. Hello and welcome to this series on the art of building trusted relationships. Now, trust is an unconscious feeling. It's felt by somebody and it's the most intangibles of the intangibles. So how can we put that into a business plan? Well, building trust is complicated and it's very individualized. However, the research states that there are four main areas to trust. Behaviors, authenticity, reliability, and the feeling of somebody acting in your best interest. In this four-part series, we will dive deeper into these four feelings and how you can tangibly implement them into your process. We hear from Core Data's global CEO, Andrew Inwood, Jane Ryan, financial advisor from Fox Wealth Advisory, Anthony Jones, financial planner from Templeton's Financial, and Anne Fuchs, head of advice at Australian Retirement Trust. In this, the first episode, we focus in on behaviours. And in episode two, we chat about authenticity. Episode three is all about reliability. And in the final episode, we hone in on the feeling you get when somebody is acting in your best interest. Thanks for joining me, Andrew. That's my absolute pleasure, Fraser. Thank you. And we're actually getting to record in in live in person these days, which we're very lucky to be able to do. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. We are talking about the art of building trust, somebody who I've had numerous conversations with uh, over a long period of time. And of course, uh, whenever it comes to the science and and the research behind it, uh, you're the person to go to. So firstly, welcome. Uh, For those who don't know you, do you want to give us a quick overview of you at the moment, what your your role is? So I'm the um, uh, uh, the CEO of Core Data, and that that sounds like a lot more important than it is. Um, I work at Cordata, particularly in the Sydney office, but across the global practice, and I'm focused on on having and managing client relationships and making sure that those things are okay. For those of you who don't know Cordata, we're a research business which focuses primarily on financial services globally, and what we're really interested in is the customer side, and we're trying to bring... Um, really robust evidence conversations, based conversations to the customer relationships because we think that's the most important part of um, of the financial services business. We're really interested in better customer outcomes and helping businesses provide better customer outcomes because at the end of the day, all, all the work and all the energy that comes through the financial services system is is to be is the stored value of customers around the world who are looking for better outcomes for themselves. So working on that and focusing on that is really important to us. And that kind of exactly wraps up why we've asked you to speak today. Uh, understanding uh, and understanding from the consumer's point of view what, why it's so important to build trust and, and have those trusted relationships. Uh, we're going to dive into the first topic um, of this. Uh, this and, and when I say this, I'm talking about all the things in and around the, the concept of trust and the history of it. The first, uh, the first thing I want to talk today is a behaviours and demonstration of behaviours. Uh, talk to me a little bit about this as, as the first and the beginning and the research behind that. So 
It's not really a new idea uh, about the way that trust works. One of the things that's really important to understand is that um, the fact that ab- humans have the ability to form relationships and store up behavior inside those relationships has allowed us to um, fundamentally rule the world. I mean, the, to not get too um, historical and scientific about it, there was a time that we um, shared the earth with Neanderthals. Um, and Neanderthals were athletically better than us. They were stronger than us. They were bigger than Homo sapiens, faster. Um, and arguably smarter. They're certainly their brain pan wasn't particularly different. But what they couldn't do was store up the value in a relationship that pass the behavior to each other. It's the ability that we have to form teams and to build those teams and to focus on future outcomes, which allows us to outcompete and to put trust in the future of someone's activity. Um, so, um, uh, so, the way that trust works is that it, it, that it works on a couple of levels. One of the things that you'll hear a lot is the concept of reciprocity, the idea that a behavior that you give to somebody, they will be hardwired to give back to you, which is always why it's nicer to be nice to people rather than mean to people. But, but the, 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 the concept is, turns out to be absolutely true and scientifically provable. So, and by building networks that allow you to succeed and by building networks that allow you to um, compete, you can build a better life for yourself, your family and for everybody else, but you can actually build up a kind of self-fulfilling behavior where your satisfaction rises, their satisfaction rises, and that trust allows you to be better and better and better. And you can see that in all sorts of ways in human endeavors. You can see it in clubs. You can see it in charities. You can see it in even religions in positive ways. You can also see it in negative ways. Um, there are some, you know, sort of anti-Semitism is a negative way of expressing that sort of um, the rise in and particularly far right or far left um Politics are a ways of explaining that. So it's both a positive and a negative integer in, in terms of the way in which humans like to form teams and form tribes and come together. And those tribes work really well together. Um, there's a really kind of interesting piece of research which is being done now around the world. And it's um, particularly for immigrants coming from African nations um, to um, Western European nations. And it, it's uh, the challenge for that is that um, – um, when people in Western European nations see the police rushing somewhere, they tend to trust the police and get out of the way and make room for them. Um, and they think that someone is in need when they hear a, a siren. Whereas in an African nation, if you see the police rushing somewhere and you hear a police siren, they, they, they think the power is being used somehow or abused somehow. So it's not about uh, that relationship. So those trust relationships are really different. We tend to be more trusting our government. We tend to be more trusting our systems, and that allows us to expand and to grow and to do those types of things. One of the my favorite example of this, and I don't want to go too much into it, I'm already diving down too much into the detail as I do, is that we tend to trust our banks. Um, we give money to our banks, and we know that we're going to get it back in the future. Um, five years ago, I was on holiday in St. Petersburg in Russia, and I was taken by my guide to the edge of Russia to a dacha, which is a small uh, country house on a lake, and it was frozen and I went for a swim in a frozen lake and I had a sauna and was having vodka and I said to Sergei, I think every Russian, Russian guide in the world is named Sergei, um, how much does the place like this cost? And he said, well, about 80,000 euros. And I said, you mean 800,000 euros? He said, no, no, 80,000 euros. And I said, are you serious? This Anywhere else in the world, something 20 minutes from the center of St. Petersburg would be worth millions. And he said, oh, yeah, but we don't have banks here. People can save money and spend it. There's no way of borrowing it and no way of actually saving money inside a bank in my lifetime. And he's the same age as me. My bank savings have been wiped out. The bank simply disappeared. So that changes all sorts of things. It changes the way the capital works. It changes the way the businesses work. So trust becomes a really, really important part of human behavior and how we store up endeavor. I mean, there's a, the sponsor of this is the Australian Retirement Trust. I mean, that's a really interesting idea and a really interesting people in Australia can absolutely trust the Australian Retirement Trust, not just because it's legislated in the way that they behave and they can trust the legislation. The people that I know that work there take this role really seriously and they are going to do everything they can to deliver the best possible retirement to people. And that's something that you can kind of in 80% of the cases bank on. That's not true everywhere else in the world. So that changes people's futures fundamentally. Yeah, it's interesting. Very interesting the way that uh, trust works around the world. I, I, when you mentioned tribes, um, I always think of tribes as, uh, you know, there's a lot of different people required to make an effective tribe work and they all be, be able to trust each other to do their different parts of the process because not everybody can do the same thing. Um, and I also think of when you mentioned some of these behaviours around aligned values and how does, how does that come into it? 
So that's a very interesting part of the way in which people work. And if you want to read about that, there's a, a great British social scientist called Robin Dunbar who came up with this concept of Dunbar's number, which is that the maximum number of relationships that any human can support is 150, which is a, a really interesting integer in the way things work. And I, I encourage you to read that. Those stored and aligned values are something which um, which are kind of fundamentally worth examining. Um Again, that's that's regional and local. Um, a great example of that, and there's lots of research pieces have done on this. That people have done it in different countries. A man called Philip Zimbio did it across the world. Um, people have done it in small towns and large towns. And again, so the classic example that if someone fell over in this, in London, someone who appeared to be drunk or disabled or old, people would walk around them. If that happened in a village, the person would stop and help them because they can think they can affect the outcome. That people tend to congregate and align values, and we have to start to think about those in all sorts of interesting ways because our nation is changing fundamentally, and we've got lots of different generational values and lots of different societal values that sit in, in inside organisations. One of the biggest filters for this tends to be money, um, and, and people who are rich tend to behave in very specific ways. And it, let's let's make rich having more than a million dollars in investable assets. And let's make it inside super as well as outside super. So it's a very big part of the Australian population. So it's north of 4 million people in Australia. So it's a big number of people. There are a couple of correlated values with that which really stick out. One is that they tend to value education really highly. They think that that's important. The second thing is that they tend to um, – um, to, to, to value deferred pleasure really highly. They're prepared to put pleasure aside for some, some for future benefits. So they're much more trusting of the system. Um, the, 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 the third thing is that's really important to think. If you think about value is they start to tend to, they tend to value, um, the concept of their pleasure really highly. Now the pleasure isn't always the same. For some people, that's expensive things. For some people, that's big balances. For that, some people, that's, um, um, the ability to, to display things. So those pleasure drivers are very different. Don't never underestimate pleasure in, in terms of, of a driver of human behavior, but never underestimate the, the kind of stored value of pleasure. Now I live, I'm lucky enough to live in a, in a street where um, it's expensive and, you know, um, I work very hard and I've worked very hard for a long time and I've had a, a, a more than my fair share of luck to allow me to get into that, that situation. And I can see this, different pleasures being sought by people along that street really, really clearly. Some people's gardens are magnificent. Some people's uh, are driving $2,000 cars when I know that they're worth tens of millions of dollars because because pleasure for them is to have money in the bank, not money in the street. Some people I know who are struggling are driving cars that I couldn't possibly afford. I drive a, you know, a 20-year-old German car because it's relatively cheap. Um, so... So those sorts of things are really important to understand. So never underestimate treasure, pleasure in terms of a motivator and never underestimate pleasure as the way in which tribes are formed because people are finding the same happiness in the ways in which they work together. Now, I belong to a bunch of tribes. I belong to an, belong to an ocean swimming tribe and they come from all over the world and all sorts of people, but they all have the joy of swimming in particularly cold oceans with us and they're an interesting group. I belong to a, a tribe of people who, um, who, who do lots of sailing and sailing for me is the kind of ultimate Marxism because those who can provide the yachts and those who can't but are skilled provide the services on the yachts. So both of those fit together. So those tribes are, are much the same. And we live our, our lives unconsciously inside those tribes. They're different to family, although some people's family are tribes. So building your tribe is really important. I think um, I break up my working day into a whole bunch of things. So I have work, operations, sales, um, pr- projects, and HR is my daily things that I have to do every day. But on my right-hand stack, I have family, which is first, self, when I do things for myself, second. And the third thing I have is tribe, because you've got to bring your tribe together. My tribe comes from all sorts of places. Parts of my tribe, I mean, one of the members of my tribe is a, is a, is a heart surgeon, and the other one is, is a guy who, um, who, who, who fixes boats, and they're different passes, and they perform different parts of functionality, but they do have all the same kind of behavior. They like information. They like to talk. They like to walk. They like to exercise. They like to do those sort of things. So building that tribe is really important. When you're building a business, like particularly a financial services business, one of the things which is really important in that is this concept of mirroring. I'm sure you know what that is, and I'm sure most of the people on the podcast know what that is. But for those of you who don't know, it's giving back behaviors to the person that you're talking to, which reflect them 
hence mirroring. So in some ways, we mirror ourselves and our tribe. We build up people who, who are like us and, and, and go through those processes. And we've watched it a lot in financial services. Very good planners and very good people in those sort of, those sort of operations are very good at mirroring the needs that the person's giving to them because the person is entering the conversation with a set of needs every time. And if you can give them back to them and solve those needs, whether you say it explicitly or implicitly, it's actually a really important integer to building trust. One of the things that we've noted, and this is, um, may sound offensive to some of your listeners in Melbourne is that most financial planners in Melbourne, when asked, can very clearly describe which football team they support and why. That doesn't really exist anywhere else in the universe that we, we do this mystery shopping in. Certainly not in Western Australia, absolutely not in New South Wales, um, to a much less extent in Queensland, but in Melbourne, particularly inner city Melbourne, it's an absolute truth. They'll tell you and they'll be able to articulate why. And when people match up to those things, then they will mirror against it. The weird thing is that if people don't like that team, for example, Collingwood, for all the Collingwood supporters out there, you know why they don't like you, um, they, they will literally say it'll be much less likely that they will support that, that advice. They'll go, yeah, it's Collingwood support. It doesn't really reflect me. So that mirroring part is, is, is quite interesting. Mirroring's a fantastic one, the old matching mirroring. But uh, I do love the concept of overlapping tribes and how everybody's got uh, more than one tribe and to be able to work through that interest. Football teams is obviously an interesting one, whether people are into sports or arts or, or whatever they might be, uh, or within their different personalities. Apart from mirroring, though, with behaviours, what do you sort of suggest if, if you're you know, working with financial advisors that they uh, – they partake in as some of the key behaviours for them in their clients. So the really important part of this is that to acknowledge, no matter how well you know the person, that your service level degrades over 36 months. Because one of the things that advisors do, whether they're conscious of this or not, is that they're very good at taking chaos and turning it into order. Now, people's lives, unless they're putting lots of energy into it, tend to, after the first order that the, the, that the advisor provides, degrades. And it degrades on about a 36-month cycle so that they have to keep coming back to that. The second thing is that whenever they're talking to someone that no one is in that state is what the, um, the psychologist would call a tabula rasa, a blank slate. They're not. They've got jobs to be done in their mind. And one of the great things that advisors do, whether they acknowledge it or not, one, number one, is provide structure and order. The second one is that they take jobs away and they get those jobs done. Um, I'm not sure as an industry we're as good at charging for those jobs that we, as that we should be because we're actually doing a good job of that. So understanding that the person in front of you isn't a blank slate. Most people, particularly men, and that's not true necessarily of men, it's also true of women, aren't always great at describing the jobs to be done or the problems that they're facing. So, and, and I'm sure that every um, planner knows this, that they have to be part psychologist and being able to ask about the task, ask about the jobs to be done and start to sort of stimulate those, those things. The other part of that, and I, I'm not a psychologist though, I, I mean, for pleasure, I read a lot about it, but that doesn't make me a psychologist. And, and psychologist is, a, is like advice. It's a protected term. So I'm very clear to say I'm not is to, is the um, difference between stated and revealed beliefs. So people tell you things all the time. But you have to be careful to observe what's revealed through the conversation. My favorite example of that is the stated reason why anyone has um, ever purchased a Rolls Royce. It's always for the resale value. I mean, no one really buys a Rolls Royce for the resale value. And it's true of what's going on in people's lives. Um, and there's so much psychology about that. I couldn't go into it with any detail and be accurate, but it's worth understanding that making sure that you're asking the right questions, that you're pushing a little bit to understand what's going on. And understanding is really, really help. And it's that combination of skills that a great advisor has between I mean, technical advisor, social advisor, and behavioral advisor. So getting back to that behavior point that you're bringing up, bringing up Fraser, one of the, again, one of the unconscious things that um, advisors do is help people, you know, go through great behaviors, making sure that they're doing the daily, weekly, monthly tasks that a person should be doing for their finances and making sure it's done properly. And that's, that's a real core part of the job. Yeah, it certainly comes to, you know, the, the understanding of both the behaviors within the business and the behaviors of the clients. And, and that's certainly a bit really, really important that, that what, how is the client behaving, even though they might be saying one thing? Uh, do you think that comes with experience? Is that something that you find that is, is probably more into the experienced advisors than, than uh, some of the technical stuff? That's a really interesting question because there are a series of beliefs around this and I don't have the evidence to, to answer it honestly is that some people have that innate skill. I certainly know people who've got unbelievable 
emotional in- intelligence and it can pick up what's going on very clearly. Some of the people who work for me in Cordata are freakishly good at this and I'll work out, walk out of a meeting and they've got a whole bunch of different signals to me and I'll be surprised by them. They're often right. I, in fact, may be really weak at that. Um, but the, uh, but can that be a learned skill? I, I mean, I be- probably anything could be learned to a certain extent, but I think that's a really kind of soft skill in the way that maybe anyone can learn to play music. There's probably only a few people who are really good musicians and maybe it's on that part of the spectrum. So I would suspect that, it, that the advisors that I've seen, and I know hundreds of advisors in the same way that you do, and some of them are freakishly good at it and some of them are who came to advice through engineering. And we don't need to say any more than that. Yeah, Their fair. technical skills are very strong. Their interpersonal skills are, yep. uh, you know, and – a weaker. Fantastic. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll put an end to this uh, particular episode, but we'll uh, we'll hear again from you in the next episode when we start talking about authenticity. Thanks very much, Jane. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Now, do you want to give the listeners a very quick overview of you and your business at the moment? Okay. So, um, my name is Jane Ryan. I'm a financial advisor. I have been in this space of financial advising for about 15 or 16 years now. Uh, About five years ago, I um, decided to go out on my own and um, start my own financial planning business. And I was a bit hesitant at first, I must admit. Um, I I didn't know whether whether it was something that I could do. And uh, and looking back now, I realise that it's something I, you know, I probably should have done long before that but really enjoy it and I'm in regional New South Wales so I travel a lot I've got clients um you know sort of from Sydney all the way up to the um Queensland border in in regional New South Wales so I so I get around um to different regional spaces which I really enjoy I get to see people in different environments yeah, fantastic and amazing, uh, amazing environment to 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 go and see people. Uh, I, I'm feeling like a lot of your clients want to see people or or, or get in front of them. And we're talking about trust today, obviously, um, but getting in front of people and seeing them and shaking hands. It was is that correct? Is that an assumption I'm making? Yeah, look, you're absolutely right. Um, I find, um, and you know, I've had some of my clients for a very long time, and. They've really always had the preference around sitting in front of people, um, and obviously COVID has been challenging for that because I wasn't able to to get out and about and sit in front of them. Um, so you know we had to to improvise with communication, but that does do a lot of around um, forming trust because I'd had a long-standing relationship with them, um, and they had seen me. I'd sat in front of them they were able to transform into a space over COVID where we were just verbally communicating, but their preference has always been for me to, to sit in front of them, absolutely. Yeah, I feel like that's this is a really primal thing, this proximity piece, isn't it? Because, um, you know, having somebody, and it comes back to behaviours, because having somebody in front of you uh, being nice to you as opposed to being a threat to you um, builds trust a lot faster with those behaviors of you know smiling and 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 physical you know handshakes that just that physical contact of, of shaking somebody's hand or or um, or giving them a hug or whatever it might be if you don't know them for a while um, but just that proximity can it can speed up behavioral patterns in someone's brain Look, I completely agree. Um, and that's the thing, you know, I when I'm talking to people, particularly new clients, um, you know, sort of setting expectations and having them understand me um, is as important as me being that, able to understand them. And one of the things, um, you know, I explain to people about some of my behaviours is that I would be a really bad poker player because my facial expressions will tend to mirror how I feel and particularly uh, with my eyes, you know, if someone says something to me, my eyes will tend to open or um, um, it, tell the story, tell the response. And so, you know, I sort of say to people, if you say something to me or, you know, if, if a client has an idea about something and I don't believe that's in their best interests, um, I won't say no if my face says yes and vice versa because the other one will give it away and uh, so I think that is really important people need to be able to read expressions I think it's um, it's an art form where people can learn to interpret how someone is communicating with them because their words may say one thing 
but their face may so- say something different. I, I love the old non-verbal cues. It's it's, it's hilarious, isn't it? Uh, and, and that's probably something that our process around how you write things down all the time and take file notes, you miss all those non-verbal cues and facial expressions. Um, I want to talk about behaviours in, in a way that, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, conscious thought around what sort of behaviours you like to, to um, introduce into the relationships that you have with your clients, what sort of, and you know, any expectations around what you will do as an advisor and what they will do, you know, as a client, uh, any conscious behaviours that you really um, bring forward to the conversation? Oh, conscious behaviours. Um, look, I think that it's very important that people can see the transparency of conversation and so if if it's a new client obviously um, the preference is for them to be sitting in front of me sometimes that's not possible if I have people from a distance that um, obviously you know of course during COVID that was impossible but it is about being uninterrupted and one of the things that I talk to all of my clients about and my existing clients are acutely aware of that and that is when they are in a conversation with me they have 100% of my attention. And so I make them aware of in terms of if after the conversation or at any point during our business relationship, they need to get hold of me. And if they can't get hold of me, if they ring me in and I don't answer, I set that expectation. That is because I'm of, you know, either in a meeting or I'm, I'm working on something. There's something that has my attention and that requires my undivided attention. And so they, it's really important that they understand that behaviour around when I'm talking to them, they have my undivided attention because I don't want to give their business and their life, their financial life, a half priority. I want to give it a full priority. So that's a behaviour that I set um, out very clearly and that is from the outset is, and that is you know, if you can't get hold of me, there's a reason for that and it's because I – there, there is something else that requires my attention and that when they come back to me or I, you know, obviously get back to them, it's because I have 100% want to invest in that conversation with them. I think that's really important. Yeah, I really like that idea of um, the, the bringing forth a conversation around attention because it, it really does make them feel feel like they're listened to, I guess. That's exactly right because I think there's lots of instances nowadays where people feel that they are not being listened to and I know I've been in situations where I felt that I haven't been heard well actually I've been heard but they're not really listening and I don't like that and you know I don't want to walk away from a conversation with a client nodding my head and really thinking about something else because then I don't recall the conversation and I'm really not working on their plan very well. I'm not working on what it is that we're on that pathway. So I think undivided attention is a, is a really big thing. Yeah, I also like that, that this being part of the conversation because the expectation around accessibility, the expectation around being able to contact you 24-7 is, is instantly negated. The expectation is then, oh, well, you'll probably – listening to somebody else or, you know, giving somebody else your full attention and and then when you can, you'll get back to me. That's exactly right. And, you know, I explain to clients what my life, you know, I I give of myself to my clients. I, they, they understand my life that I have, you know, small children and, um, you know, I have a lot of things that go on in my life as everybody does. And, um, and I, I provide a lot of flexibility. Uh, so, you know, I'm happy to see clients after hours. Sometimes I see clients on weekends, but there are times where I'm unable to see them or unable to um, to have a conversation with them because of that. And I think when people really understand what your whole existence is like, well, that helps them to understand you yep. and build yep. that trust. I definitely want to get into that when we talk about the next episode with authenticity. Are there any other behaviours that you talk to your clients about, um, uh, whether it comes to, you know, behaviours for them getting information back or, 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 or behaviours around your business and how you, you, um, you show up every day? Yes, look, um, one of the things that I talk to clients about is we try to give them as little, bit, as little homework as possible because 
we all know what it's like to go somewhere and see someone and be really leaning into that conversation, invested in the conversation. Yes, that sounds great. Yes, we want to we want to move forward with that. And then, you know, potentially you go to see someone and they give you a little wad of paperwork. Yes, I'm going to do that. And you walk away and you get in your car and you leave and you put it on the front seat or put it in your handbag and then put it somewhere and you never really get around to it. So one of the things that we talk about with clients is we're really not, there's not too much that we're asking you to do. And if we are asking you to do it, we really need you to do it. Jane, thanks for talking to us about, uh, you know, the behaviours in your business. I look forward to catching you in the next episode when we tackle the authenticity piece. Thanks, Fraser. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me, Anthony. Hi. Glad to be here. Fantastic to have you along. Now, uh, do you want to give the listeners a quick overview of you and your business at the moment? Sure, yep. No, we uh, we run a um, relatively small practice now. It was a larger practice several years ago um, in Brisbane uh, called Templeton's Financial. And the uh, business has been operating for about 40 years. Um, and I've been there for just over half of it. Um, and I guess we've probably seen the, the whole raft of changes right from start right through to sort of where we are today. So, um, and uh and look, I guess we've got a fairly defined sort of target market these days. I guess we've, we've learned a lot of things over the years in terms of what works and what doesn't. And um, I think we're in a sort of good spot, quite a comfortable spot now as far as that's concerned. Fantastic. So uh, it was a larger business, shrunk and, and became a smaller business. Yes. Interesting, interesting uh, for part of this conversation when we're talking about, um, you know, trusted relationships and, and the art of building trusted relationships. Uh, and then probably the, also the art of... Um, of moving moving relationships on, which is also probably something you've been through. Um, do, you to, do you want to start? By, I really want to get into this conversation today to to focus on some you know behaviours around um, what what expectations can be, and, and tell us a little bit about from your business or your practice point of view uh, how that's worked for you for for new clients and also for existing clients. Yeah, I think with new clients, I mean we, we've always only ever accepted referrals. Um, I guess we've never really marketed we haven't um, gone and sort of tried to get people off the street so to speak and i think that as an opening sort of point there's already already that sort of little bit of trust there i guess in terms of you know being referred by someone who may have been a client for some period of time um and one of the things that we always do uh, generally is particularly if someone rings and says oh hi i'm such and such i've been referred by you know whoever it might be um i always take the opportunity to ring the person that's referred them uh, for two reasons. One is just to thank them uh, for thinking of us. Um, and, but secondly, and probably more importantly, I then just have a general chat to them and try and get a little bit of background on you know how long they've known that person, where they've known them from, because I think to some degree that gives you a little bit of an idea. Not not always. You don't sort of try and preempt, but it does give you a bit of an idea about the sort of person that you might be dealing with. Um, so at least you've got you know, a little bit in front of you. So when you do meet with a client, you know, you're not sort of starting from from scratch. So, you know, for example, if someone's known someone for 30 or 40 years, you could pretty much rely upon the fact they've probably got some traits that are fairly similar um, in, in a large respect because if you've known someone for that long, you've obviously, you know, gotten on for that long. So you probably share similar types of arrangements. So we find that is a really great starting point for us. Yeah, it, it certainly is now because um, it's always interesting to work out what's been said, isn't it? Like, what 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 did they say about you? What was the expectations that they've set a, around you? Mm-hmm. And also, um, uh, you know, the the other way too. You know, what uh, what's the expectations coming in? Yeah, and I guess sometimes we sort of make not not so much a joke, but you make it fairly lighthearted in terms of oh, what have they what have they said about me or, or those sorts of things and. Uh, just, you know, puts everyone sort of at ease and, you know, I guess we don't take ourselves too seriously. We always keep, you know, our conversations with the clients we're dealing with pretty pretty casual and um, as far as that's concerned, I think that just gives people that immediate sort of sense of, oh, you know, it's not, not too over formalised because a lot of people just have no idea what to expect when they first turn up to meet you for the first time. So in that regard, I think the, the more casual you can make it and sort of refer back to the relationships and, you know, it's just things like, oh, you know, what, you know, I sort of talked, you know, I had to a client recently and um, they'd obviously been referred by another client of mine and um, the, the other client of mine actually gave you, said, oh, a bit of a warning on these people, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they'd been dancing together for 20 or 30 years. So, you know, just using that as part of that conversation immediately, the client sort of just almost sort of felt at home that, oh, you know, you know, you already know that we do this, this and this and, you're showing a bit of interest in the sort of things that are important to them. 
Yeah, I think um, you mentioned the word expectations there. I think that's really important, you know, setting up expectations at the beginning, um, expectations around what you do in a practice um, and, and how you how you behave and how you you know how you act but also um the 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 concept of maybe how the client what the expectations are on the client as well how do you approach that sort of conversation with yeah look that that's really important because i guess we take the view that most clients probably haven't come and seen a financial advisor before um some have um but then you can't sort of rely upon the fact that they may have gone through a similar process so one of the first things we always do is sort of confirm to them that because they've been referred by whoever it might be, um, there's no cost for that initial meeting um, with us. Because I know people get quite sort of apprehensive and say, well, how much is all this going to cost and what am I actually going to get? So, so the first thing we do is say, look, you know, I guess we have no sort of expectations about what we may end up doing for you, but what we need to do is just find out a little bit about you, what you're trying to achieve, and then we can actually work out from there whether there's anything we can do to help you. And if there is, and we do need to do some work, then we will provide you with an outline of what the fee is um, and say to them, look, there should be no expectation from you then that you have to pay an ongoing fee because, once again, we need to sit down and work out whether there's anything you need on an ongoing basis as well. And I generally find by doing that, people um, are immediately almost at ease because, um, you know, we've explained the process, what they're going to go through, how we're going to do it. Um, and uh, we have a general chat and we can sort of decide from there, you know, whether there's compatibility because yeah. one of the things we are now, we're very, um, I guess we've got certain philosophies about the way we do things and so we're not a great fit for every single client that walks through the door um, and the one thing we won't do is compromise the way it, what we do and how we do it um, just to sort of fit in, you know, someone that may not necessarily fit in with the way that we want to operate, so... I think that's a really important conversation to be able to, to understand what your philosophies are up front in that first meeting or, or if, if not before so the clients understand that and then, you know, you can make a, a fit conversation well before you get involved. Look, absolutely, and, and particularly, I mean, something as simple as, you know, investment philosophy. You know, you might have a philosophy around this is the way we operate portfolios or, you know, we only use index funds or we only use active funds or we only do this or we do direct shares, we don't do direct shares. Um, so, for example, we don't do direct shares at all. Um, we don't do it. So if a client came in and had that expectation, then one or two things can happen. Either we walk out after five minutes and there's no nothing further to do, uh, unusual, or we can say, look, um, that's okay if you'd like to do that. We don't do that, but there are other people that we can organise to do that aspect of, of that sort of thing for yep. you. But Because um, I guess we've learned over the years is that I think when you first start out, you're, you're trying to be all things to all people. And you soon realise that at some point, you know, the piper has to be paid down the down the track, and um, you know, you sort of, you know, it's difficult because you, you are starting to sort of build a business, but you realise down the track that that's not necessarily the the best outcome, and I guess you sort of start to sort of refine your offer to to clients. And I think also too, once you, once you really have that philosophy and you 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 truly believe in it, then I think that comes across to the client in a very positive manner, and they get some confidence that. Um, you know, yes, we think this is the sort of thing that we we think will will benefit from. Yep, yeah, I want to touch on some of that more of that conversation in in the next area. But um, just before we move on to that, I wanted to um also the talk about the concept of leaning into the fees conversation and leaning into charges and 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 I guess that to me that comes back to a, a fear in the back of the client's head with this if there's something not sure or if there um if something hasn't been brought up at the beginning so so leaning into that concept of here are all the things that you might be thinking or feeling that are fearful or unusual and we're going to lean into those immediately so that you, the client doesn't have to ask uncomfortable questions and i think the really important thing is um is explaining to them that we won't you know i always use a very simple example but we won't do any work and charge you unless we believe we can add some value to you so for example i'm not going to charge you a hundred dollars if you get twenty dollars worth of value out of it for example and, and again, those sorts of little, I know they're sort of simple, but putting ourselves in the client's shoes, I mean, they have absolutely no idea to, to a large degree what to expect from the process and how things are going to operate. Um, so I think the simpler that we can make it, um, I guess I'd probably fall into the trap years ago where, you know, all, you, all you're trying to do is, ex, you know, show the client in the first meeting just how much knowledge you've got and how you can do this, that and the other. But at the end of the day, you soon realise that, 
that's not really what the, the client's there for. They're there to sort of improve on their position or because they've got some fears or concerns. And that's really our job is to allay those concerns. And um, But you know, I think having that upfront conversation, people feel at ease and can then concentrate on the rest of the meeting. Otherwise, they'll be sitting there for the next half hour going, how much is all this going to cost? How much is all this going to cost? And not really be listening or participating the way they should be in the conversation. Yeah, fantastic. Anthony, thank you so much for being part of this first episode. Now, I do want to dive into some of the stuff that you've said in this, in the in the additional episodes, especially around the concept that all of your new clients come from existing clients, from existing clients, which obviously, uh, you know, tells us there's a lot of, a high level of trust there already. So uh, let's dive into some of the conversation in the following episode. Sure. Thank you for joining me, Anne Fox. Fraser Jack, it's been a while. It's so great to see you. Absolutely great to see you. Now, we are recording this live, so you might notice that dynamic in the conversation. But let's start with you. Start with the uh, giving us a quick overview of you for our listeners. So, I have been around a really long time, 25 years. We've worked together a long time. I'm Head of Advice of Australian Retirement Trust, which is the marriage of QSuper and SunSuper, two big super funds coming together with 2 million members, $200 billion of assets. And my job is to make sure that the nurses and the teachers and the retail workers and the small business owners and the farmers and the miners and all of these people around Australia get more financial advice. Well, fantastic. And uh, and thank you for taking the time out to speak to us because that's obviously a huge, huge job you've got uh, ahead of you. And obviously, I think we've been speaking off, Mike, but uh, you've had a lot of work to do. Yeah, we've got, uh, there is a lot of work to do bringing these two big funds together with two very different histories with the Queensland government and then obviously Sun coming from the private sector. But, you know, we're heading to where we've got this ageing population, we've got the retirement income covenant, so the team are really excited about the impact we're going to have so more members retire with dignity. Fantastic. Now, uh, this first episode we are discussing and opening up the conversation around uh, the art of building trust and in particular in this episode it's around behaviours. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that means to you and, and, and how you've seen uh, advisors ad- adopt uh, an attitude towards focusing on their behaviours for building trust. So the advisors that inspire me around building trust have a, a such a sense of service and humility and integrity, which is just, I'm drawn to them and, and inspired by them. I can see their faces in front of me and... Um, look, I recognise that there's, a, a, you know, there are a lot of affluent, um, high net worth investors that advisors want to work with, but I'm particularly inspired by those advisors that want to help the, the ordinary person, the mum and dad who've worked hard all their lives and they've got 300,000 and they're not seeking to create complexity to justify a fee. They're seeking to find simplicity to help somebody live you know, the, the dignified life they deserve to live because there's so many Australians now. We've had three decades of super SG. It had its 30th anniversary a couple of months ago or in July. And so there are all these people that are wealthy for the first time that wouldn't have been wealthy, but their financial literacy is low. And these advisors just have a lovely approach to finding that simplicity so people can sleep at night and just live an in income and just to appreciate the simple things, you know, and they don't really want to talk about investments and portfolio construction. They just want to know their money is going to land in their bank account every month. You know, those very, very simple, important things. Yeah, well, certainly, it certainly is an important thing for trust with uh, money landing in the bank account when you said it was going to land in the bank account. Uh, talk to me a bit more about that simplicity around that, the concept of um, taking the complex and making it simple as a behaviour rather than uh, creating more complexity. If I think about us, um, uh, when I started uh, uh, years ago, you know, it was all around investments, portfolio construction, and the advisor's value proposition was solely around almost con- creating creating complexity to justify a fee year in, year out. Uh, I think in this in our regulatory environment, we're in the advisors that are that uh, are the exemplar in terms of professionalism and just living that trust are the ones who just distill and remove all that complexity because most Australians aren't that literate financially and show them the simple things that they can do. They talk the, they talk the client's language. They, they don't try and speak jargon to somebody who's a, who might get paid a lot of money. They might work at Blue Scope Steel and be a fitter and turner, but they don't understand that much. And so they're able to mirror the, uh, the client's language, body language, and distill all of it and show them how they can, um, create, you know, save some tax solve for longevity and, and those things which really most people need. Yeah, fantastic. So sim- simplicity is a, a great 
uh, cornerstone, I think, for this this conversation. Um, with the you know the many members you see, as you said, you're mm. two million, two plus million yep. members, uh, and the advice industry predominantly being towards that more higher end uh, side of it. T- mm. Talk to us about how what the opportunity for advisors in the in the middle market. I yeah, so I remember years ago, Graham Rich um, from Portfolio Construction Forum showing uh, at one of his conferences. Uh, the Seven Up series, the BBC Seven Up series, and it was obviously the wealthy kid who went who went to Oxford, and every seven years they check in, and he was he was reading the Times magazine at sixteen, which was a little bit precocious, but that's all right. And then <laughs> and then there was the other kid who was the orphan who emigrated to Australia and became a builder. And at the end of it, Graham Rich asked the audience, "Oh, what you know, what what does this mean in terms of advice and what you do?" And everyone's kind of just sat there blankly. And um, I and I didn't speak up, and I re- I said to Graham after I said I knew the answer, but I didn't want to look silly. And he said, "What was the?" He said, "What's the answer?" He said, "Well, we should be helping those people who have worked really hard to accumulate a decent nest egg, but they they need to make the most out of it. If you're rich, you're rich." And so I see an enormous opportunity with two million members that are aging rapidly, and we're heading into really really turbulent economic and geopolitical times. And so people are going to be more nervous than ever. So they've got a big nest egg because of super, very challenging economic times. People are living longer. So how do we help those members get financial advice? And so the advisor can help them find the the simple strategies that allow them to just get on with life um, rather than making it more complicated to, to justify fees year in, year out. Yep. Yeah. Fair enough. Now, apart from um, you know taking the complex and making it simple, what are some of the other behaviours that you see from advice firms that are doing it really well? I I love seeing the advice firms that are using really innovative ways to help support financial literacy. That are embracing technology. I've even heard about you know these really cool digital SOAs and video SOAs. Anything that we can do. Advice documents um, are the opposite of easy to understand. They're bad enough for us who are in, you know, who are in the profession. So I think that the advisors that are actually finding innovative ways to support that informed consent and understanding um, is great. Um, and I think, you know, embracing that one good thing that came from COVID was Teams and Zoom. And so that's uh, that's the other thing I think is just that advisors, we know from our research that members love the relationship. Look, what we've found from member research around the trust and innovation, and, you know, we were talking, you know, I mentioned obviously one of the good things from COVID was teams and that accessibility, how much of that supports the relationship. The research we found is that that relationship is what members want. They want to be able to talk when they're worried and being able to do that face-to-face over a video um, is is fantastic, um, and at the port at the you know at the corner of it all is people are happy to pay a fee when they see value, and if you can create simplicity and show the value through that, then uh, people will be talking about you to their friends and family, barbecues and the like. Yeah, I love I love the idea of being able to transfer the the idea of value not just to a financial gain. Like obviously a financial gain is required, but then obviously to say that what I really got out of that conversation or that that relationship with the advisor was this understanding because now I understand it all. Yeah, it and I and it could be actually guess what? I can I hate my job. I'm a sixty two year old nurse. I'm so tired of working. I can't stand on my feet and my advisor has told me I can afford to retire or scale back to two days a week. So it's not about the money at all. It's about that this advisor has created a sense of empowerment and relief almost <laughs> that they can, they've can. they got other choices. So that's certainly what we, the feedback we get from our members about the advisors that work with um, the art members. Fantastic. And I'm looking forward to diving into a bit more of that research as we go through these episodes because I know you've done a lot of research from both advisors and also members. So we'll get stuck into that uh, when we join when we join you again in the next episode when we start talking about authenticity. Okay. Sounds like a plan, Fraser. Mm-hmm.